Now let's assume that you're in about 1989 and you're a teacher in a school that might be working on a computer program. Well, back in those days, you had a lot of different options for educational software. There was the Apple software line for the Apple IIe or Apple II Plus systems, which was fairly extensive. A lot of companies like Mech and others would get involved in making educational titles. And then on the other hand, you had IBM and PC compatibles, including the Tandy 1000 and many other systems that also had an extensive library of software for educational titles. So with a limited budget, what do you do to get the best of both worlds? That's where we introduce the TrackStar Plus. This little device was built with the pure intent of being able to emulate an Apple II Plus, an Apple II regular, or an Apple IIe on an IBM compatible machine. Now there were different models of this particular card available. The one that we have is the TrackStar Plus. I believe the first one was the TrackStar 128. They're all very similar, but they were designed for more specific variants of the IBM family. This particular one was designed specifically for the IBM PS2, Model 25, and Model 30. Um, essentially, this box includes a card, instruction manuals, and software that, again, are specific for this model to the IBM PS2, Model 30, and Model 25. So, this brings us to our set of challenges for today's experiment. Our IBM PS2 is basically a complete unknown. The Apple IIe system, which you may have seen in a previous video, and by the way, if you haven't had a chance, please like and subscribe. Everything on it is working as to spec. The IBM model, on the other hand, is completely untested. This particular IBM PS2 came out of the back of a truck and a warehouse uh, find that we were on, and same with the monitor. The keyboard is actually from a Tandy, uh, so it's not the original matching PS2 keyboard but it is compatible connector-wise and functionality-wise. First of all, we're going to have to see if the monitor itself works. If it works, we can use it. If not, we're probably going to have to use a more modern LCD screen. Then we have the actual PS2 that we're going to have to test and get working. At the very minimum, we're going to need to get this machine functional so that it can boot off of a boot disk and be able to function so that we can install the software required for the TrackStar card. And once we get all that done, then comes the challenge of actually seeing if this card will actually work and allow us to play an Apple II game on an IBM compatible computer. So let's find out. So the TrackStar cards were made by a company called Diamond Computer Systems, Inc. They were in Sunnyvale, California. Again, more commonly, there's the TrackStar 128, which I believe was the first model. This would have been a later release. And as you can see on the box, now you can run Apple II, Apple II Plus, Apple II C, and IIe software on IBM PS2 models 25 and 30, even the copy-protected programs. Let's take a look at what's inside the box. First and foremost, we've got the actual software program itself on floppy disk. I hope that this disc reads because it is the only copy we have. We've got the TrackStar Plus user's manual, the card itself, which is really just a standard ISA card for a PC. Essentially, this isn't really just an emulator. This is an actual Apple IIe on a board that goes into the computer. Here's a header cable. Looks like it's got a header that attaches to the board piece of metal here that would go into one of the card slots on the back of the machine. And there's another cable here, and this may be to accommodate the differences between a Model 25 and a Model 30. And really, the main difference between an IBM Model 25 and 30 is the fact that the 25 had a monitor built in, so it was basically all, an all-in-one computer, whereas the PS2 Model 30, like the one we have, had a separate monitor and a separate PC. The following parts are used for the Model 30. It requires the board itself, the joystick adapter cable, the bracket for the Apple joystick port, and the video adapter cable, which in this case was already plugged into the card. We are ready to go and try to get the TrackStar board actually installed and working. Remove the Model 30 cover, which we've already done. Use the middle slot for the TrackStar board and the top slot for the Apple joystick port. Remove the brackets from these slots. So let's go ahead and uh, get these out of the way here. Nice and gently, just like that. Nice and gently, just like that. So it wants the new card to be in the middle slot. Now we select the video adapter cable for the Model 30. I've already got that connected to the board here. It's kind of this external cable. Feed that through the opening of the expansion slot in the rear of the computer. So the next thing we need to do is get the Apple II disk drive, and that actually plugs in directly into the TrackStar card. 
Now it says connect the video adapter cable to the PS2 Model 30 video output. All right, that is connected now. Now that we've got the disk drive and the monitor connected, we simply connect our LCD monitor screen into the output of this new card. Let's find out if this will power on with the TrackStar installed. It says to go ahead and make a copy of the install disk, so we're gonna, we're gonna do that first. We're gonna grab a blank disk, format it, and uh, put a copy of the program on it. Now we've got our full complement of disks here. I should be able to put this away. We can run off the copy by itself and not have to touch the original again. And according to this, the Starcom program is what actually kicks off the TrackStar into Apple mode. And if I understand this correctly, it's going to try to boot off the Apple disk drive just like it was in Apple II. So for this, I'm going to use a copy of Dragon's Keep, a game for the Apple II. And I know this game works, although the disk does have a couple of bad areas where the game gets stuck. But for testing purposes, it should be good. Insert the disk that you wish to run in the Apple drive. Press the enter key when ready. <laughs> no way. I think we've got a winner. Yes, I have played this game before, as a matter of fact. Press return to continue. Oh, now, now we're in front of the house. Should we go in the house, climb the ladder, or go around to the backyard? I mean, I'm going to go with climb the ladder. You are in a boy's bedroom. Go into the upstairs hall, look under the toy box, or look under the bed. Let's look under the bed. All you can see is dust. That sounds accurate. There must be something in the toy box. Alright, let's look in the toy box then. When you open the box, a cat is there. Looks like there's a dragon breathing fire on the cat too, which seems like a problem. I mean, I feel like getting the cat out of the toy box is probably smart at this point. But nah, let's just pet the cat. When you pet the cat, you see that he is caught in some string. Help him. Please return to continue. Well, let's get him out of the toy box then. Oh no, the dragon won't let me do it. Well, it appears the only option I have is to reclose the toy box. So sorry, cat. You're in there with the dragon for good. Seems like the functionality of the card is working exactly as it should. Um, the Apple II functionality seems to work exactly like it would on the Apple IIe. The colors look pretty good. This is a VGA monitor and a modern LCD, so it's a little bit more noticeable with the pixelation. And it doesn't fill in the whole screen, which is probably just the side effect of the resolution that was used on the PS2. Honestly, it seems like it's working as intended. Now you might be wondering, what's the point of all this? If you have to have an Apple II disk drive and the original disks, what really is the advantage? You can actually take your Apple II discs, make a copy of them in IBM format, and store them on your normal IBM disk drives. In preparation for storing the contents of an Apple diskette on an MS-DOS drive, we reserve an area 266 kilobytes long on the MS-DOS disk. This will contain all of your Apple data and formatting information. This reserved area is the track store disk. When we copy all the files from one of your Apple disks into the track store area, you will be able to run Apple programs from it just as if it were an Apple diskette. Now we have the option to boot from drive A, which is the track store format instead of the actual Apple drive. Let's put in our track store disk and see if we can run Dragon's Keep from the actual IBM drive. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, this is a fail. The Sierra game, Dragon's Keep, is probably heavily copy protected. They were pretty good about those kind of things. Apparently Apple used a method in a lot of cases where they actually used the half track marks on a disc instead of the normal positions so that people that were making a standard disc copy wouldn't be able to run the disc. The TrackStar system has a way of copying all of the half tracks, so it uses basically double the amount of space as a normal disc, but it captures every possible position for that type of copy protection. My guess is, and the manual indicates this, that there are other types of copy protection that you can't really get around 
using the Trackstar system. So I want to repeat the experiment using a different game with our version of Wheel of Fortune. Okay, all right, well, we're getting further with this than the other games. I am not a returning champion. Thanks for asking, though. All right, well, this game at least seems to be functional. So let's see if, let's see if we can do this. We're gonna exit out. We're gonna try to copy both the discs. Now, for the moment of truth, we need to see if we can finally get something to run off of an IBM disc in the Trackstar system. Insert disc one, see what happens. It's the most promising I've seen so far. There we have it. Finally got one to play off of the actual IBM disc. So it does work as advertised, just with a lot of caveats. I think this is interesting because it's a really early example of doing something like an emulator, which is extremely common now. People have DOS box. You can run DOS games on any modern system. There's emulators for pretty much everything out there, like the Apple II and all the various computers, many of which we're going to talk about here on Vintage Geek. Instead of being a pure software emulator, it's literally a piece of hardware that you put in a computer that included essentially an entire Apple II, which was why it was so expensive when you had to buy it originally. And yes, it does involve a learning curve and a lot of installation work. If you get it installed, you have a fully functional IBM PS2 computer, fully capable of running all of the IBM software available at the time, as well as running Apple II software, either from the floppy disk, as we demonstrated, which was probably the more preferred way of doing it, or actually copying those Apple disks to IBM formatted disks, in which case you could use your hard drive and store multiple at a time. Ultimately, I would say it's a pretty good product, and I'm not sure how much use these got at the time or how many of them sold originally. I don't have any statistics on that, but uh, we're glad to be able to test it here in Vintage Geek. And when we do open the museum, we'll give you the opportunity to be able to play with one of these and see it in action. Although I would say that for the Apple II, I probably prefer the actual Apple II hardware. Um, it just looks a little bit more natural, but uh, this is pretty cool. So I'm glad we got a chance to try it here on Vintage Geek. Thanks for joining us today. And if you do get a chance, if you like what we're doing, if you love vintage computers or you like the content we're putting out, please like and subscribe. It's going to help us out a lot as we grow. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Aaron and this has been Vintage Geek.